I'd like to start with some Spanish, if I may. Como irani, le tengo afecto la gente chilena. Quizás debido a la historia que compartimos, o porque Santiago me recuerda a Tehran. Me encanta su ciudad. Siento la calidez de su hospitalidad y me siento honrado y muy feliz de estar aquí. Aban, uh, hablando con ustedes hoy. Gracias por escuchar mi precario español. Ahora volvamos a mi precario inglés. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I used to introduce myself as an Iranian physicist uh, turned filmmaker. And uh, but ever since uh, the Americans and the Israelis started assassinating Iranian scientists, I am just a filmmaker. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you some stories uh, about how the stars and the planets have influenced my life going from physics to filmmaking. But before you panic thinking I'm going to bring out my astrological charts and talk about my star sign and how the sun is rising from behind my moon, let me assure you, I am a scientist and I don't believe in pseudoscience. I stick to facts and meticulously observed scientific data, just like any perfectionist who's born a Virgo. <laughs> now, um, I was looking for a story that illustrates the connection or the clash between physics and film, and I couldn't quite find one in time for this uh, talk. But luckily, last Friday, I was at a gala dinner in London where the guest speaker was a high-ranking corporate executive who in a previous life was a PhD astrophysicist at, at Princeton. And he told a story which I liked, which I have shamelessly stolen for you. And stealing is going to come up quite a lot in this talk. So this is a story. There's a corporate executive on a hot, in a hot air balloon basket, drifting, flying, and he's lost. And he's very anxious because he's promised to meet a friend at 12.30, and it's now high noon, 12 o'clock, and it looks like he's not going to make it. But on the ground, he sees a man walking. So he calls down and says, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? And the man on the ground says, sure. You are 26.64 degrees north, 114 degrees 0.68 west, and you're about 25 meters above the ground. The corporate executive says, well, thank you. Um, are you by any chance a physicist? And the man says, yes, I am. How do you know? He says, well, the information you just gave me is absolutely accurate, it's geographically and scientifically correct, but is of absolutely no use to me. And now I'm not going to find my friend. And the physicist says, well, I'm sorry about that, but are you by any chance a corporate executive? And he says, yes, I am. How do you know? Well, he says, you see, you have no idea where you are and where you're going. You have risen high up on a lot of hot air. You've made a promise you can't possibly keep. And you're blaming the people below you for your mistake. <laughs> now, obviously, that has nothing to do with filmmaking and physics, but I will, at some point, adapt that story. So let's go back to film. I'd like to start with showing you something I made 16 years ago. When I was a little girl, I really wanted a typewriter. And my father bought me one. So why would you want a typewriter at that age? Well, I couldn't play the piano. I couldn't learn. I wouldn't be bothered to learn, but I did want, I did, I did want to type. And um, I just did. I wanted a typewriter.
Now, the sound we missed, we missed at the beginning was when she was a little girl and a story about her childhood. Now, I bet we all have piano, typewriter kind of stories lurking in our childhood. And I'm going to tell you about mine. Uh, I grew up in pre-revolution Iran under the rule of the Shah. I went to a school uh, where most of the teachers were political activists, frequently arrested by the Savak, the secret police. For a bunch of kids, we were quite savvy and politically well informed. Books by, banned by the government would be smuggled into school, passed under desks, and you'd take them home one by one, and as you walked home, you would look over your shoulder just in case. Now, for, uh, it was a life lived in fear, but for a 12-year-old boy, it was quite exciting. We were future revolutionaries heading for 1979 and the overthrow of the Shah. But I was never part of the inner circle because I discovered another love, cinema and television. This was the early 70s, and I was hooked on American imports like Star Trek, Mission Impossible, Colombo, all beautifully dubbed in Persian. Mr. Spock and the Klingons, fluent in Persian. Captain Kirk would deliver those end-of-episode profound homilies in words used by Rumi and Omar Khayyam. Now, in the summer, I would sleep in the garden under cherry trees with jasmine wafted in the air and be drunk, looking at the stars, in those days, Tehran's sky was clear. It was not polluted as it is now. You could see the Milky Way, you could see shooting stars and meteors. And I was lost in my imagination. Now, all this came to an end when in 1975, I went to school in England to learn English and carry on with education. At school, I was good in sciences and physics and maths. And, and I ended up at Nottingham University doing physics, uh, where I took an option in astrophysics. And it was at this time that I was starting watching lots of lots of science documentaries. I was in love, and uh, I would uh, watch everything this man made. Cosmos was, was my daily diet, and I was watching science documentaries by the BBC about a very young Stephen Hawking, and I was also devouring lots of lots of uh, science magazine. It was magazines, and it was at this time I suddenly came across this incredible revelation that shifted my life. Voyager 1 space probe had just sent some pictures back in March 1979 from Jupiter's moon Io. Now, Io is an unusual uh, moon. It is the most geologically active object in the solar system. It's covered in volcanoes, over 400 volcanoes constantly erupting. And this was just interesting, but what, was, what, what really threw me was astronomers had decided to name one of these volcanoes Amirani. Now, I thought I grew up Amirani because my grandparents came from a small village called Amiran, and in those days, if you came from Amiran, you'd be called Amirani. But here I am, linked to a volcano. I read some more and found out Amirani is also a Greek, a, a, a Georgian fire god. Now, can you imagine what it does for a young, shy, awkward physics undergraduate to suddenly find his link to this most astronomically active, geologically volatile, fiery volcanic thing in the solar system, and also possibly the descendant of a Georgian god of fire. This obviously totally inflated my sense of self, so when it came to do my graduation project in the final year, instead of doing an experiment in the lab and writing it up, I insisted I should make a film, and I ended up convincing the physics department to let me make a film about black holes. Now, what you're about to see hasn't been seen very much by many people. It's a film I made in 1984, and there are a few things to work, look out here for. One is that, in those days, I had hair. The other is that I take myself very seriously. This was my Carl Sagan, Captain Kirk moment. And the other thing is that I press far too many buttons, which are actually, in our space trip model, uh, upside-down plastic jam pots. There are many strange and interesting ideas associated with black holes. For instance, black holes serving as time machines, carrying us to the remote past or the distant future. 
or gravity tunnels providing interstellar or intergalactic subways that would enable us to travel to inaccessible places much more rapidly than we could in the ordinary way. Or how about this, a black hole the size of the nucleus of an atom solving all our energy problems. Now, I stole a lot from Carl Sagan's books, Cosmos. I watched BBC Science documentary and I plagiarized lots and lots of scripts and I even used bits, bits of interviews uh, from uh, Stephen Hawking. Now, that got me a degree in physics and it also got me a place in, at film school where I carried on copying from my heroes, one of whom was Woody Allen. In fact, I've probably seen all of Woody Allen films you know, inside out, backwards, and my love life in some ways is like a long Woody Allen film without the laughs. So that's Manhattan, obviously, and I made a short black and white silent comedy very soon after film school based on Manhattan. We didn't have money, so it's a silent comedy, and that's my version. And that got me a job in television and my first break. And obviously my first documentary had to go back to astronomy. And it was a documentary about uh, amateur astronomers, charming eccentrics who have their feet on the ground but their hearts are in space. And this was a film made in 1989. Let's get it aligned properly now with these aluminium pegs. Well, we're interested in the fact that we're his parents and so we're interested in what he's interested mm. in. But apart from that, it's a very cold occupation. Mm. I mean, it's, it's usually called when it takes place, you see, and uh, it has to be a clear night. Night, so and if it's it can a clear start night. at ten o'clock and go on till three or four in the morning. When we think, what is he still stuck out there? <laughs> <laughs> Where's it? This fascination of looking upon other worlds. I enjoy all of the planets. They're like individuals, really. There's different things going for each one. With Jupiter, you've got the wealth of detail in the belts and zones, the fact that there's something always happening there. Mars, you've got your seasonal differences. Polar caps, dark markings, you see it rotating. Venus, you've got the phases, similar with Mercury and with Saturn, you've got that splendid set of rings. Fantastic. And that launched me as a filmmaker with the reputation of a guy who makes films about English eccentrics. There came the 90s and some 20 films about English eccentrics. This was about a man who during the day is a car park attendant and at night he's an exorcist. Uh, Britain's only black ventriloquist who had two dummies, one white, one black. The white one didn't show up for this photo shoot. Uh, this is a film about uh, allotments, community gardens uh, in inner city areas. Now, there's this Iranian foraging through the back gardens of the English psyche, looking, I'm not sure for what. A magazine once asked, you know, do you feel after so many years in England, are you feeling more British or more Iranian? And I said, my head is British, but my heart is Iranian. And I wouldn't have them the other way around. Now, uh, when I start making a film, I don't have a plan, I don't structure it too much, and I deliberately don't research it too much because I want to leave a lot to serendipity. I get a sense of what it's going to be about, but the journey of the making the film is the exciting part. It's the discovery of the person you're making a film about, your own journey of working your way through the story and discovering and coming with amazing moments that you could have never planned. Now, I was on a roll making films for, the, uh, for India in the 90s when suddenly I got invited to make a film about this man. And I was very close to actually signing up a contract to make a documentary profile of Barry Manilow. I didn't know much his music. The only thing I have in common Barry with Barry Manilow is the fact we all have very large noses. Just as I was about to sign the contract, planet Jupiter crashes into my life again. I get a call from BBC Science Department saying, you can go forward, saying that uh, there's a comet that's broken into 21 pieces, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, and it's heading directly for Jupiter. It's the first time ever in human history that we can observe a, an object crashing into a planet. Do I want to make a science documentary about this? Well, do I? For the first time, I was going to get a chance to meet real astronomers, go to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, meet the discoverers of the comet, and spend time at the Hubble Space Telescope. It was a no-brainer, so I sadly dropped Barry Manilow. And as the comet was approaching Jupiter on its way, I headed to the States to, mess, to make this film.
I had seen something and it clicked in my mind. I had seen something and I backed up and here was this very strange looking object. There's uh, definitely a lot of anticipation, uh, a lot of nervousness about what's going to happen. Uh, you know, this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to, to uh, see the impact of, of a body into a planetary atmosphere and recorded history. It was the strangest thing that I had ever seen. Uh, and uh, you know, I really wondered what we had. It's like there's an extra shot of energy coming. And if people know that, they can go with it. And if they don't know that, they might get knocked over. This is as if nature has decided to do an experiment. Nature sent us a telegram and said, listen, I am going to take 21 comet fragments, plow them into Jupiter at 60 kilometers per second. All you guys have to do is watch. In 1992, Jupiter's gravity broke the comet called Shoemaker-Levy into at least 20 pieces. Photographed About to smash into the planet Jupiter. Preparations for what could be the most dramatic astronomical event of the century. When the comet pieces strike Jupiter, it will be the most massive collision of celestial objects. crashing to the planet with the force of millions of nuclear weapons. So it looks like every time I try to get back on track to making films about something else, planet Jupiter just pulls me back in. Now, for a while, there was no astronomical event that affected my filmmaking, but it was a historical event that changed everything, and it was 9-11. After 9-11, I was done looking at uh, astronomy or eccentricities of the British. I was more interested in Western foreign policy in the Middle East. So when uh, America invaded Afghanistan in 2001, I got on a flight and went to Afghanistan to make a film about the lives of refugees in a Taliban-controlled refugee camp. This was a BBC documentary. And it was a matter of time before I crossed over back to Iran to make my first film in Iran uh, after many, many years. And this was a film about uh, life behind the scenes of a reformist newspaper. And naturally, being there, I started looking at Iran's history. And what I'm doing now is making a film about this man. Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, he was Iran's prime minister in 1951 and 52, 53. He had the audacity uh, to nationalize Iranian oil and get rid of the British. And he was named man of the year uh, in 1951. But uh, the CIA and the British Secret Service organized a coup in 1953 and overthrew Mossadegh to reinstall the Shah. He was, in fact, arrested, for, arrested and put on trial for treason and then put under house arrest after three years where he died a sick old man. He was potentially Iran's Mahatma Gandhi, potentially. He was the, the potential father of a future democratic Iran. And this is the film that I'm making, and we would not surprise you, although I'm not gonna tell that story now, that astronomical events, the beginning of the universe and the Big Bang are having a direct impact on how I'm making this film. That's the story of my next talk. I am, of course, going to go steal everything I can for the making of this film. I'm going to steal from your filmmakers, Patricio Guzman, I adore. I am going to steal from other filmmakers, uh, books, and I'm going to talk about stealing because that's the name of the film, by the way. Is originality overrated? It is. Now, I'm going to leave you with a quote and some thoughts. And I'm going to read this for the Spanish speakers. We can then hear the translation. Nothing is original. Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and your theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. And then remember what Jean-Luc Godard said, it's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. Now, I'm linking this to filmmaking, but it, it could apply to anything that you, you do. And of course, this was stolen by me from Jim Jarmusch. So I'm now gonna give you absolute permission to go out there and steal, get inspired, celebrate it, and share it. It might lead to something beautiful. Thank you.